The nation is in mourning because of what happened at the school in Texas. <coughs> Anytime little children are victims, normal people, when I say normal people, that means those who have normal emotional reactions are profoundly affected. The whole nation is affected. Everybody's in mourning because of what happened to those little children. All across the nation, you can't help but be affected by that. It's on our DNA to be protective of the young. Don't mess with the bear cub. You're going to get a face full of claws from Mama Bear. I came close to that one time. Don't mess with a mad mother. A normally mild-mannered woman will turn into a terrifying machine when <coughs> her child is threatened. You saw that some of that happening. The talking heads on the television are all trying to suggest different reasons why this punk would shoot his grandmother and then kill as many as possible in the school. They're all trying to figure out why is this. But our hearts go out to the parents and the grandparents and the friends of those innocent children. We really do pray for them. You see people on television, our hearts and prayers, our hearts and prayers are with you, and you wonder, you know. I know some of those people are believers and they do pray. But we really do pray for them. We don't just say that. So what do you say? What if, what, what if you were there? What would you say? You know, there's no words that can bring comfort when a, to parents when, when the children are just gone. You send them out with a kiss in the morning and you never saw them again. There's no words you can speak to people who've had that. Grief is a process, but the sting of the loss of those children will last for a lifetime. A lifetime. The only comfort we can offer is that Jesus loves children. Mark chapter 10, 13 to 16. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw this, he was <coughs> indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. The slain children of Uvalde, Texas, are in the arms of Jesus. That is the only consolation that we can offer. They're shooting people in schools. They're shooting people in stores. They're shooting people in churches and synagogues. The synagogue in, in what is that, Squirrel Hill in Pittsburgh? Shooting in the streets. Shooting in the subway in Chicago. Is that an example of how things are going to be? Portland is an example of how things are going to be. Rioting, burning, looting. Is that what we can expect? Where is the next shooting going to be? People wonder. We're not safe because we're in small towns or in the country. That was a small town. No one expected that to happen. We're not safe because we're out in the country here. We're not safe anywhere. Just because we're rural doesn't mean that we're safe and it can't happen. It doesn't mean that. By the way, if we ever have an active shooter in here, you get down on the floor as far as you can. These two armed people in here. And we're prepared. But just all you have to do is get down as far as you can so you don't get shot in a crossfire. If there's ever an active shooting. 
You have to be prepared. So what does it all mean? Second Timothy chapter three, verse five verses. But mark this: there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. Does it sound familiar? Is it what you see on television and around us? Verse 3, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, verse 4, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. That's a description of the times we're in. The times were then and times are now like that. We think we're in terrible times, and we are, but the times will probably get worse. They blame the guns. The trigger doesn't pull itself. They blame mental illness. They blame the COVID isolation. There might be something to that. Children do seem to thrive on having an association with other children. But when have you ever heard of a homeschooled teenager killing people? But they're in the isolation of being homeschooled. They don't go out and start shooting, shooting up a school. Blame social media. There might be something to that too. People of like warped mind feed off of each other in these sites. If parents aren't very diligent about what these kids are exposed to on social media, they may be headed for trouble. And the trouble is a disaster for the innocent. At least it was in this case, and in the Buffalo case, and in the Sandy Hook case. We took Bible reading and prayer out of the schools, thanks to Madeline Murray O'Hare. Without the Word of God, there's no basis for behavior that pleases God. Church attendance is an all-time low. Outdoor activities are more important than God. Our culture has lulled people into thinking that they don't need God, that they don't need church. The culture presents that fundamental Christianity is bigoted. That's what they present. The Bible is labeled as hate speech. So the culture we live in is glorifying things that the Bible, and therefore God, calls abomination. The culture no longer upholds the nuclear family. A man, a woman, a real man, a real woman, and children, as the standard of society, no longer holds that up. This gender pronoun business is another one. You reap what you sow. Moving away from God, moving away from Judeo-Christian standards of behavior puts our culture on a collision course with God. The culture will not win. Nobody can win in a collision with God. Amen? So who or what is to be blamed when these tragedies come about? Blaming doesn't help. Blaming won't bring the children back. Blaming won't relieve the grief of this tragic loss. But we do need to realize what's happening here. 
when these mass shootings happen, the talking heads on television immediately ask all these questions. Was this person bullied? Did this person have a mental illness? Was this person economically disadvantaged? Was this person a loner? Was this person a drug user? Find something to blame. No one asks, did this person have a concept of righteousness? No one asks, does this person attend a church or a synagogue where the concept of right and wrong based on God's will is taught? Nobody asks that. They look for all these other things, but nobody asks, did they learn about right and wrong somewhere based on God's right and wrong, not society's? No one asks what's being taught in the home or what's being taught in the school to that particular thug. Right and wrong in the schools is based on feelings. If it could offend someone, it's wrong. Don't say certain words. Gender words can get you in trouble. How about Blaming the shooter. How about blaming the crime on the criminal? There's an idea. Blame the shooting on the shooter. We're too busy trying to paint the criminal as a victim of circumstances. How about blaming hatred? How about blaming evil? This punk murderer was an evil person. That's right. He was a bad person. He was a hater. Only a hateful person would shoot his grandmother in the face. No one seems to blame evil. Only a few. To many, evil doesn't exist. To admit that evil exists, one has to admit that righteousness exists, and righteousness can only be what pleases God. Amen. The culture wants to keep God out of it. Well, this is the result. The culture denies, the culture that denies God also denies sin, because sin is whatever is dis displeasing to God. So we're in a culture that doesn't admit there's such a thing as evil or sin. Jesus said this in John 16, 6 to 11. Now he had, he had just told his disciples that they would face persecution because of their faith in him. And then he said in verse 6 um, to 11, verse 6, Rather, you are filled with grief because I've said these things. Very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The advocate is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was what brings conviction of sin and brings us to our needs and brings us to Christ as Lord and Savior. Verse 8, when he comes, he will prove to the world, uh, prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. That's what Jesus said. The world to be wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. The world is wrong. The word is right. The world is wrong. The world has always been wrong. Adam and Eve were wrong. In the time of Noah, the whole world was filled with violence. The world was wrong. In the time of Abraham, God called him out of a culture of idolatry, out of a wrong culture. In the time of Moses, after the people agreed to follow God, Moses went up on the mountain to get the law, to get the decrees from God. 
and the people demanded an idol to worship because 40 days passed and they didn't know what happened to him. They were wrong. Aaron was wrong to give in to them. They got around Aaron and demanded, make us gods. So they gave him their golden jewelry and he fashioned a golden calf and they worshipped it. And then when Moses confronted him, he said, they put the gold in the fire and out came this calf. He lied to Moses. Wrong. David was wrong to have Bathsheba brought to him. He was wrong again when he orchestrated Uriah's killing to cover up his own sin. Wrong. The northern ten kingdoms broke away when Solomon's son became king, and they immediately set up two golden calves to worship. They were wrong. The Jews of Jesus' time rejected Jesus as Messiah, and they demanded him to be crucified. They were wrong. It had to happen. It was prophesied, but they were wrong. Millions of people have been killed in wars over territory, over power. Those wars were wrong. In this country, there's been a past of racism. It was wrong. It was evil. Right and wrong has to be determined by what pleases God, not what pleases people or those in authority, but what pleases God according to his written word, not by what seems to please mankind at a certain time in history or some notions that they put forth. And then in verse 9 it says about sin because people do not believe in me. So what is sin? The world denies that there is such a thing nowadays. Modern philosophy denies the existence of sin. But any such denial is part of a false philosophy. The Bible teaches sin's existence and the human heart displays, displays it. Sin is not a myth. It's not a fragment of the mind. It's a fact. And the fact is that we are all sinners. And the fact is that sin separates us from God unless we repent and receive Jesus as Lord. John chapter 1, 8 to 10. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we can set, confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. But we're in a culture that doesn't admit sin. We are destroyed by our own sin. Only those who believe are forgiven. Those who do not believe in him will perish in their sins and wind up in the lake of fire. Those who don't believe refuse to believe. Say it again. Those who do not believe refuse to believe. Yeah. I can remember refusing to believe. Titus chapter 2, 11 and 12, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. All people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Grace is offered then to everyone. Some accept it, some refuse it. Secondly, in verse 10, it says about righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. Christ is our example of righteousness. What would Jesus do? Do you really want to know? Do people really want to know? They put that cute little saying up on a wall. Do they really want to know what he would do? Or is that just something cute to put on the wall? Do they really want to know? Examine in every 
if they're like what would Jesus do? He lived a sinless, perfect life. He was a lamb without blemish. His life of perfection enabled and qualified him to be the only sacrifice that would pay the penalty for all of our sins. He lived the only sinless life. Isaiah 53, 4 to 6, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that was in Isaiah, way before Christ came. But it spelled out what would happen and what he would do. And the third point in verse 11 is, it says, in about judgment, <coughs> because the prince of this world now stands condemned. The prince of this world, Satan himself, is condemned. He's destined for the lake of fire, and he knows it. He's the father of all lies. He's the father of hatred. He's the father of evil. If Satan's, if Satan's, it is Satan's evil that causes rioting, looting, burning, and mass murder. It's Satan's evil that resulted in the, in the murder of the children and the teachers in Texas. And all these mass murders, evil, manifested in a shooter. The gun's not evil. That's right. The gun doesn't go search people out and pull a trigger all by itself. Satan's goal is to destroy the work of God. His goal is to destroy righteousness. He hates it. His goal is to destroy anyone or anything that spreads the gospel. Why do you think churches are shrinking? 1 Timothy 4.1, the Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. About judgment, People are all sinners. Those who believe in the Lord Jesus as Savior have the imputation, that means putting on, of the righteousness of Christ. All others who share the same fate in the lake of fire as the one they are deceived by. Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave. The only thing we have to do is believe it and receive him as Lord and Savior. And we turn away from a life of darkness and sin and live in holiness and do our best to please God. What can be more evil than murdering a classroom full of children? There have been 248 mass shootings. This is described by a shooter that, that shoots, not necessarily kills, but shoots four people or more. 248 of them in the United States so far this year, killing more than 250 people, wounding probably more than that. And this nation has permitted the murder of 63 million unborn children. We live in the midst of evil. Believers are in a minority. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So what do we do? What do we do? What's the conclusion of all this? What do we do? Carry the gospel. It's the only good news that can pull anybody out of the darkness. Carry the gospel. Bring the holy light of God's gospel, of God's word. 
into the dark places in people's lives. And with God's help, we might win a few. Yes, amen. The Bible speaks of a broad way and a narrow way. And the broad way leads to destruction and the narrow way leads to eternal life. And it says, few there be that find it. We are the few. And it says, you know, this is going to all the world and here and preach the gospel. So what do we do? What do they, you know, what do they say? Watch out for internet, this or that, and watch the behavior, and watch this and watch that, and you know, don't sell guns to some people, and can you do that? Can you do all that stuff? But you can't carry the gospel in the dark places of people's hearts, and pull them out of the darkness. You can. Anybody can. I told you once before, I was photographing this girl in, in, at Lock Haven High School. And she said to me, I'm just having a yearbook for, for my picture for the yearbook. I'm not buying any pictures because I'm saving my money for a missions trip. I thought, awesome. This is just a very ordinary looking young lady, but she had a fire in her. You can kind of tell. You know what I mean? You can tell. So the next day, this other girl comes in. And she said the same thing to me. She said, you're going, you're going on a mission trip with the girls in here yesterday. She said, yes. And she said, you should have seen me a month ago. I had black makeup on, black fingernails, purple hair, and a razor blade around my neck and a body full of drugs. But that girl wouldn't stop inviting me to go to church. Wouldn't stop. Wouldn't give up on me. And she was pulled out of that dark, same kind of darkness this shooter was in. If a high school girl can do that, we can do that. Amen? Just a high school kid. Nothing special about her. Nothing attractive about her. She wasn't a sharp dresser. She was just very ordinary. A plain Jane, you might say. But the two of them we're being holy together. Isn't that an awesome thing? Mm -hmm. Go to the missions trip. That would change their life. Carry the gospel. That's all I'm saying. And maybe you can pull somebody out of that. Maybe you never know. The person you the person that gets saved can be derailed from doing evil. I wonder if anybody shared the gospel with that young man. Ever. Ever. I don't know. They don't ask that. They want to know if he was exposed to this. If he, they want to know all these social things. They don't want to know about the gospel. That's my message to you. Share the gospel. Would you stand with me? I'm done talking to you. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to get together. And this was a hard, a hard message for me to prepare and to deliver. It was a hard one, but you gave it to me. And I thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to bring these morsels of your word into the house today and into the hearts of the believers. And I pray that the words go where you want them to go and that they have the effect that you want them to have. Bless your people as we go our way. And bring us across people's paths that need the gospel. And just and just say to us with a still small voice, share the gospel with that person. Lord, it's been good. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.